Good morning, everybody. This is the matter of the people of the state of California versus Kellen Winslow. This is case number SCN387417. I'm sorry, it's Kellen Winslow II. Uh, this case is being heard pursuant to emergency rules three and five and pursuant to the general orders of the presiding department as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. This hearing is being broadcast live to the public via YouTube. Can we have appearances of the council, please, starting first with the people, Mr. Owens? Good morning, Your Honor. Deputy District Attorney Dan Owens on behalf of the people. Thank you, Mr. Carlos. Carlos. Good morning, Your Honor. Mark Carlos appearing via video. Uh, with Mr. Winslow, I'll be appearing via video. With Mr. Winslow, he's also in custody appearing via video. All right. He consents to this hearing? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Uh, the matter is set for the court today for a purpose of probation hearing and sentencing. The first matter is the request for the media. Um, I did receive multiple requests, uh, and I emailed those to counsel uh, yesterday, including the new one we received today. They are from the dailymail.com. All the local media, which includes CBS 8, NBC 7, KGTV 10, Fox 5, KUSI, the Union Tribune, and every other local media outlet here in town. There's one from Eva Knott, the San Diego Police Press Pass, or I'm sorry, for the reader. Uh, there's also Court TV Media, Law and Crime Productions, Alita Juan, uh, freelance independent true crime writer, and uh, the Union Tribune from Terry Figueroa, who's uh, present here in court uh, for a still camera. I sent those all out to uh, counsel, and uh, I made modifications to those uh, that have uh, requests for camera coverage, uh, ordering uh, them not to photograph or publish the faces of the victims or their family members. Uh, that order will also extend to any names uh, other than uh, fictitious names that appear on the screen. Uh, any objection to the court signing those orders, Mr. Owens? No, Your Honor, thank you. All right, and then uh, Mr. Carlos? No, Your Honor. All right, then the media requests are all granted. Here you go, Your Honor and uh, with those uh, subject to those restrictions. All right, then, uh, as indicated, the matter is set for the court today for purposes of probation, hearing, and sentencing. Uh, Mr. Carlos, uh, are you ready to proceed at this time? Yes, sir. Any legal cause as to why sentencing should not proceed at this time? No, Your Honor. And waive arraignment for purposes of sentencing? I do. All right, thank you. The court is in receipt of the probation report that was filed with the court on February 22nd. Mr. Owens, did you receive that uh, report? I did. And it was February 22nd of this year, I should indicate. And Mr. Carlos, you received it as well, correct? I did, Your Honor. All right, then. Uh, it is a stipulated sentence based on the modification of the change of plea form. It calls for a stipulated 14-year state prison sentence. Uh, Mr. Owens, do you want to be heard? Do you have any victims that would like to address the court? Uh, yes, I do, Your Honor. Um, I do have Jane Doe's 1 and 2 who are both in uh, the district attorney's office. They are observing the proceedings uh, through a, uh, in a witness room, uh, testimony room. Um, Jane Doe One has requested that I uh, read her statement on her behalf. Uh, Jane Doe Two has actually elected to read her statement uh, herself. So uh, we ask that the court's order uh, titleizing her face be in effect at that point in time. Uh, Jane Doe Three has elected not to make a statement Jane Doe 4 is uh, appearing remotely on Microsoft Teams as well. She is logged in under that alias. She and her husband uh, would both uh, like to make a statement that they have previously written out. And then lastly, Jane Doe 5 is logged in on, under a relative's name. Uh, she would like to make a statement as well. So we could just take them in, in order whenever the court's prepared. Okay, I'm ready to proceed. Do you want to start with Jane Doe number one statement that you are going to read? Yes, Your Honor, I'll do that now. All right, go ahead. Your Honor, I was so scared when he raped me that every black Jeep that drove by might be him. I was scared to go outside not knowing who it was. I can't believe he could be so nasty. It really hurt my feelings that he took advantage of me. He scared me so bad knowing now that he was my neighbor, and I couldn't believe that an NFL football player would take advantage of me. I hope that you serve the 14 years and it really impacts your life if you ever come out. I hope you get the help that you need. And sign Jane Doe 1. All right, thank you. And then Jane Doe number two, uh, you want to, uh, Jane Doe number two wants to address the court uh, via Microsoft Teams, correct? 
Yes, and if I can just uh, request of my uh, victim advocate, Isabel Rodriguez, if you can just assist Jane Doe 2 with turning on her video and unmuting herself and then count down from 10. And are they under witness? What, what is the screen name, Mr. Owens? Witness North 02. All right, we'll just go ahead and pin her up, all right? And can you make her bigger there? You want me to unpick everybody else? Um, no, that's OK. All right, so we do have Jane Doe number two up on the screen, and the uh, media is ordered not to uh, photograph her face. Uh, so Jane Doe number two, would you like to address the court at this time? Yes, sir. All right, go ahead. Okay, good morning, Your Honor. Thank you for your job. I would never be able to do your job. How do you know when someone is truly telling the truth? That man is not a good man. I don't think you know how truly dangerous this man is. Ever since I've been raped, I couldn't lift my head or take a couple steps. I felt trapped, worried, scared. I felt like I had no rights. I couldn't live my life at all. I was very worried about my safety and I was feeling like I need to be with someone to feel more secure. This crime has affected me emotionally, always feeling scared and having anger. I've been hurt and in pain for so long. I'm out of a job, no place to live, don't know what directions to take, always felt like I was being sabotaged no matter what I tried. I don't know where to begin or how to live my life. No one has the right to take someone's life and it's not your life that has been taken. It's mine and the other victims. If you don't think rape affects a human being life, you're damn wrong. It's affecting my life every day and every night. When I stay at my brother's house, I look under beds in closets and will probably never stop. I don't ever feel safe inside or outside. You brought so much damage to my life. That completes the statement, Your Honor. All right, thank you very much for being here, Jane Doe number two. All right, then uh, you also indicated that Jane Doe number four and her husband would also like to address the court, Mr. Owen? Uh, yes, Your Honor, and uh, Jane Doe four, if you could hear me now. Uh, whether you or your husband would like to go first, that's entirely up to the two of you. All right, Jane Doe number four, can we pin her up? And if you can just unmute yourself and turn on your video and then count down from 10. Um, All right, now we have, we have her on the, on the screen, but you can count down from five. Go ahead. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. Um, Good morning, Jane Doe number four. Of course, we're using your, uh, your alias as we did in court. Thank you for being here today. I understand you would like to make a victim impact statement. So whenever you are ready, you can go ahead. Thank you and good morning. Um, sorry. <laughs> During this process of facing my attacker 15 years after the act has affected me emotionally and physically with the stress and fear, sad and sadness. The stress of reliving the act that Mr. Winslow forced upon me in 2003. The sadness of reliving the act and having to speak out loud about this horrific moment of my life. Not only has this affected me, but my family as well. The anger my husband has felt having to listen to his wife talk about a man taking advantage of her. My children watching me cry and shut down because I'm reliving this moment. 24 seven, having to travel multiple times across the country to sit and tell my story over and over again. Playing the event in my mind shook every bone and nerve in my body. The first time I went up to testify, I was, I was exported right past Mr. Winslow. My, my skin began to crawl and I felt as if that act had just happened and that I was that 17 year old girl crying and freaking out and not knowing how to speak. As they sat me down to wait for my turn to testify, I cried and cried because you hurt me. Mr. Winslow has hurt me and damaged me for so many years. 
<laughs> well, it, while it was cold, I said Stan. I shook because I was scared and nervous. I cried because Mr. Winslow had done a horrible thing to me. After I was called down from the stand, I felt a little bit stronger to keep pushing forward to put Mr. Winslow away for what he had done to me. Because now I have a voice, a voice I did not have as a 17-year-old. Mr. Winslow has taken so much from me that finally being able to put him out and make him hear what he's done to me makes me feel empowered and that every victim should know that they have a voice as well. I feel that with everything that Mr. Winslow has done, he should be sentenced the full 14 years. It may not be life, but at least we can keep him away from harming anyone else. Um, I will go ahead and get my husband to... All right. Ahead. Well, thank you very much for being here today. Um, thank you. And thank you for your statement. Is your you can put your husband on now? Okay. And your honor, for the record, uh, his name is uh, T M. The initials. I believe uh, that was the way that he testified uh, previously at trial. Right. Okay. Jane Doe, number four's husband. Are you there, sir? Yes, sir. All right. Would you like to go ahead and make a statement? Uh, yes, I would. All right. Go ahead. Uh, the effects of rape are lifelong and do not only apply to the victim. I have experienced and witnessed it firsthand. I mean, I remember being burst from my sleep by my wife crying and screaming, having to try and explain that she's okay, safe at home with her family. Her explaining she was re reliving being raped in her dream. I want nothing more than to make her feel safe, but I can't prevent the nightmares returning. There were times I had to abandon my wife while she was crying to take care of our children, only able to explain to the children, mommy needs time alone. The children shouldn't have to witness the devastation that rape caused their mother. I feel helpless as a husband. I should be able to protect, defend, and nurture my family no matter what. How can I do that when the damage doesn't go away? During the trial, my wife had to explain how she was raped on numerous occasions. Each time, she was reliving that nightmare. This would cause a storm of emotions and distress throughout our family. She would withdraw from everything, often for extended periods of time. Try explaining to a child that mom is upset because she was raped and won't be joining us for dinner. Even the concept of that aggravates me. My wife shouldn't have been raped, as well as our children shouldn't have to bear witness to the results of that rape. When I think of what could possibly right the wrongs that have been done, only one word comes to mind, justice. Marion Webster defines justice as the quality of being just, impartial, or fair, the quality of confirming to law. I firmly believe that anything less than the maximum punishment allowed by the law would be a disgrace at everything my wife had had to go through. In her pursuit of justice, you cannot quantify the damage that has been done to my family. It might never be fixed, but if the law can enforce the maximum punishment, I think that feeling of justice being served can give us something that can't be taken away. All Thank right. You, Thank you very much, sir, for your statement. Mr. Owen, do you have, uh, I understand that Jane Doe number five would like to make a statement herself, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. And Jane Doe 5, I'd ask you at this point in time to count down from 5 and turn on your video if you would like. Wait just a moment. We're looking for her. Just can a moment. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Go ahead and keep speaking. Is that One, two, three, four, five. All right. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Uh, you can turn your camera on if you want, but it's not required. If you'd like to make a statement, you can go ahead and do so now. Good morning, you all. Although uh, 
I am not supposed to include evidence about the crime itself. I can describe the emotional impact that it has had on me since the two encounters with the vendor. The first encounter it was very emotionally and intimidating as I was alone in a large area, second floor of my gym. I could see there was no one to yell out. I truly felt unable to do anything. However, it left me so embarrassed, ashamed, and with a weak, guilty feeling that I was not being able to yell out or do anything. It scared me that I had been in that horrible situation and did not even let the gym manager know, or my husband, who was downstairs at the time of the encounter. And there was a second encounter, one in which the defendant made physical contact by entering the spa jacuzzi and sitting right next to me and pressing towards me. As the only two people in the spa, once again, I was frozen. The defendant has an intimidated presence and had made it known that he was not wearing a swimsuit. I was alone and he continued to edge closer to me. Fortunately, my husband came in and all I can think about is that why I was unable to yell out or run. Why do I freeze? Which of course, the defendant already knew. I was the perfect victim from the first encounter. There was nothing to stop him from approaching me again. Due to my shameful actions he caused, I have suffered sleepless nights ever since the first encounter. Despite receiving therapy, I'm not sure if I will ever let up. We are allowed to see, to stay, what we would like to see happen to the defendant. I would like to see him given the maximum jail time for his many offenses because this is somebody who has been allowed to utilize his financial privilege and celebrity to evade jail while awaiting trial, which is when he victimized me. It shows that this is a defendant who does not learn from his mistakes, who shows no respect to our laws or the court system. But more importantly, he has preyed on all the women. He has preyed on women in their own homes. He's a sexual, is a sexual predator and must be stopped because he's a very good judge of the perfect victim. Elderly woman who will not scream and run or fight, but who freeze and who are at a physical inequality to begin with compared to his. This is somebody who has committed crime after crime and gotten away with it until now. We need to protect the woman in our communities from the search of predator for as long as possible. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Owens, do you happen to have a copy of her statement that she sent to you or no? I do, Your Honor, and I can certainly forward that to the court reporter or, or Don. Yes, you can go ahead and forward it to Don. She can provide it to the court reporter. Okay. All, all right. right, thank you. All right, I want to thank all the uh, victims for coming forward today and offering their, their victim impact statements. Mr. Owens, do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I just want to briefly comment that I, I do thank each one of the victims who have provided their statements today. They've shown incredible courage throughout the entire process. And I think that the court can see, based upon those statements, that the uh, genuine impact that these crimes have had on them. Um, and I have spoken with them multiple times uh, before the trial, uh, after the trial, and then, uh, of course, more recently as we've been preparing for the sentencing hearing. And I think that that impact that they've experienced has been lasting throughout. Um, and, of course, the court's aware that there's been a, a wide array of sexual offenses that had been committed, even the court can see from Jane Doe Five statement that the impact itself, uh, even from a lewd act in public, uh, does have significant consequences for the person who is committed against. Um, and that's saying nothing of the tremendous impact that 
uh, these violent sexual offenses have had on Jane Doe's one, two, and four. Um, so I do applaud them for being able to come forward and still being able to be strong enough at this stage in the process to be able to address the, the court personally. Um, the last thing I would say uh, regarding the sentence is that we do believe that the 14-year term is appropriate uh, given the jury's findings and the convicted counts of trial, as well as uh, the defendant's admissions, uh, spe specifically to the assault with intent to commit rape of Jane Doe 1 and the uh, rape of an unconscious person involving Jane Doe 4. Uh, it's our sincere hope that that provides them with some measure of justice uh, based upon what was done to them and the fact that they were able to move forward and, and testify regarding those offenses. Um, as it relates to some housekeeping matters, Your Honor, I would like to ad address the custody credits. I believe that based upon the probation uh, officer's report that was provided uh, to counsel, uh, the most recent report that lists out the custody data on the bottom of page 12 is accurate, uh, that that is, uh, that is an accurate recitation of the custody credits, including uh, the 2933.1 credits that Mr. Winslow ought to be uh, uh, provided by the court. From the preliminary hearing date, when Judge Elias modified his no bail order to then set bail at $2 million, which Mr. Winslow promptly posted the following day, um, he did not order Mr. Winslow to be placed on home detention. It was very specific, both from the transcript as well as the docket and the minute order from that hearing. He was ordered on GPS monitoring and allowed either the Sheriff's Department through, uh, through their uh, CPAC uh, agency uh, to monitor him or potentially SCRAM, which is a private agency that's contracted with the, uh, with the county. Uh, CPAC did place a electronic GPS uh, bracelet on him, and that was on him from July until he was ultimately taken into custody again on March 4th of 2019 at, by this court's order issuing a no bail hold based upon his conduct in the incident that gave rise to the charges involving Jane Doe 5. Um, I believe that the Yanez case is entirely distinguishable because that contemplates home detention, an actual home detention order where the defendant is confined to his residence and therefore in essentially constructive custody. The GPS order that Judge Elias provided at the time of the preliminary hearing is entirely distinguishable and he's not entitled to those statutory credits. So uh, with that, I'll submit to the court on the terms of the plea uh, and I reserve any further comment. All right, thank you. Mr. Carlos? Just as to the, uh, the issue regarding the home confinement, I uh, need to point out to the court that this was a sheriff-imposed uh, CPAC, not a SCRAM, so he was actually being supervised by law enforcement. Uh, was, there was a, there was a, uh, a, a, a curfew, curfew uh, aspect to it as well, and, but for the sheriff's and law enforcement's, uh, I guess, um, surveillance of him and knowing where he was as a result of the court's order, that's why he, his, bowl was, his bail was ultimately revoked and he was placed back in custody. So we, we, we submit that he is entitled to those approximately nine months of credit uh, for his, uh, seat, his sheriff imposed seat back. Okay. All right. With respect to sentencing, do you have any comments? Yes, Your Honor. Um, myself, Mr. Owens, and to a, certain, to a certain extent yourself, Your Honor, we've been through this case for quite some time. It's been going on for now a couple of years. Uh, we've been through a lot. It's been a very emotional uh, time going, you know, dealing with the trials that we've had and, and the victims and, and preliminary hearings. It's difficult. And for me, practicing uh, as criminal defense for as long as I have, a, a case like Mr. Winslow is, is really difficult to get a hold of. I mean, we have a guy who basically has everything. He had everything. And um, he's here. I, it's, I just scratched my head over this thing, I, trying to figure out you know, where and, and, and how things kind of went off the rails uh, for Mr. Winslow. What I can point out, though, is that throughout this evolution, Mr. Winslow stands before the court. He has accepted responsibility. He entered a guilty plea. You know, he, he went through trial the first time. Uh, there were some issues for appeal that he could have litigated. There were multiple victims in, in this case, which there, we had transcripts, uh, cross-examination transcripts. They could have been impeached yet once again. But Mr. Winslow decided to, 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 to 
enter into this plea agreement to stipulate to a term, which would then put a close to it for both himself as well as all the victims in the case. And for that, he has accepted responsibility. He's not shirking any of, uh, of you know, the actions that are attributed to him in this particular case. Going back to what I was discussing about Mr. Winslow is that, you know, you got a guy here, he's, he's 37 years old. Uh, he was a family man. He has two kids, two young kids, a boy and a girl, who are mm -hmm. basically his pride and joy. I mean, he, all he really wants to do is get back to those children. He wants to be a part of their life, whether it's in their teenage years or, or you know, whenever he can get there to, so that they can know who he is. This is a man who all his life has been pretty much under public scrutiny. It's his dad, as we all know, Kellen Winslow Sr., Hall of Fame in, in San Diego back when Chargers were Chargers and 49ers were 49ers and no one ever got traded. Mr. Winslow, his father, was one of the kings of San Diego. And everybody was significant pressure on Mr. Wait, just wait just a moment, Mr. Carlos. We lost for a minute because we're getting some background from the detention facility. I didn't hear that last sentence. Can you say it over again? Uh, with Mr. Winslow, his, his father, Kellen Winslow Sr., because of the nature of pro football at the time, was played in San Diego. Everybody knew him. It was a small town. So there was an enormous amount of pressure on Kellen to perform like his father. And he, kind of, he, 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 he gravitated toward that, and he decided that that's what he wanted to do. And he put everything he could into football. And leaving high school to the University of Miami, in 2016, playing on a national championship team, the Miami, Miami Hurricanes in 2016, which is, I'm sorry, 2020, which, or 2000, sorry. Yes. Which some people say it is the greatest college football team ever assembled. Uh, that he, he's on that team. He was an All-American. Uh, he won the he won the Mackey Award for the best tight end in college football. And he was the first round draft, draft choice later. And he, sixth overall. I mean, this is a man who was doing everything right, and he was performing at the highest level. Then he picked up an injury on a motorcycle, and that was a problem for him because it was, a, it was after his, his, uh, his um, first year in the NFL, and the torn ACL took a significant amount of time for him to recover. Despite that, he was able to play an additional almost 10 years in the NFL uh, in pain, um, depressed sometimes because of not being able to perform the way he should because of the knee injury, uh, taking pain, medic pain medications, and doing what athletes do, just like just like uh, military individuals do, just like sometimes police officers. You know, they tough it out. Rather than seeking out any type of counseling, rather than going to some type of therapist, Mr. Winslow decided to tough it out, just pain. Just like anything else, he would just take it. Take the pain, take the pain, take the pain. And that caused a significant amount, and you saw we, we submitted psychological evaluations to the court, that caused a significant amount of, of depression and anxiety for Mr. Winslow. His removal from the NFL, his, not, his inability to play in the NFL caused him to drop, drop into a deep, deep spiral of depression and anxiety. And as a result, he self-medicated through alcohol, pain medication, uh, spice, marijuana, whatever he can get a hold of. But that was his way of self-medicating. The reason all that is important is it kind of dovetails into the elephant in the room, which is CTE. Now, the court knows and, and uh, you know, prosecution knows and we know that it's not admissible, that would not be admissible in the trial to, to relieve him of liability in this particular case of the general intent crimes. However, we believe it to be a extremely mitigating factor in, when, in, in considering Mr. Winslow's involvement in the instant case. We presented evidence of, this, of the spec scan by Dr. Faber which found frontal lobe damage. We presented uh, Dr. Clark Smith, uh, who took these spec scans and found that he was, you know, he diagnosed the depression and anxiety and symptoms, symptoms consistent with CTE. Then Laura, Dr. Laura Hopper put it all together using Dr. Smith and Dr. 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 Faber and found him to be suffering from uh, mild traumatic dream disorder as well as um, uh, potentially CTE. She couldn't rule it out. And she explained the, 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 the way it worked upon Mr. Winslow's psyche and upon his, his functions of his brain, all the damage that had been done. 
So during, the, during this particular case, I met with many, many experts on CTE. Uh, obviously, there were a lot of people who were trying to, to, to help Mr. Winslow out and, you know, pro football players as a whole. And the best, the best example that I got, and I included it into my sentencing memorandum, was imagine wearing a helmet, you know, put a helmet on and run into a brick wall from five feet away. Do that every day for 10 years. And that was what Mr. Winslow was dealing with. You've got a 260 pound muscled athlete who on every play of the game is suffering some sort of head trauma. He's running across the field full speed. He's hitting somebody. He's catching a ball. He's getting hit. He's going down on the ground. Every single play, he's, he's sustaining a head injury. Day after day after day. I think we broke it down just with the, the, the game time, uh, the amount of practices. We felt, we felt that he's probably had head injury at least a thousand times. His head made contact with something of, of, of you know, either a, another helmet, the ground, a whiplash, you name it. Now, the reason this is important, of course, is because that the frontal lobe impacts the decision-making process as well as your impulse, impulse control. You may be doing things which are you wouldn't do under normal conditions. And I think that the conduct in this particular case is supportive of this finding of CTE or potential CTE. We know that CTE can only be found when one person is dead in an autopsy. But we can look at symptoms. You know, we can, you know, we can see Mike Webster walking around in the, in the forest, you know, aimless, and we can see people doing crazy things, you know, committing suicide. We see Junior Seau, who, another king of San Diego, who, to all his friends, was the greatest guy in the world, happy-go-lucky, and he puts a gun to his head. Those type of things are indicative of what Mr. Winslow is going through. Because if you think about it, and I alluded to this in my sentencing memorandum, it, Jane Doe 4 happened when Mr. Winslow was in his teens. That's an outlier to this particular case. And because they both, you know, she consented to be with him. So it's not like he went and picked somebody up off the street. And then you've got a period of like 17 years before something happens again. And at the same time, this, this, this athlete, this star athlete, who is going to every major city in the United States to play football, uh, followed by adoring fans and women throwing themselves, you know, potentially at his feet, in the days of cameras and cell phones who take, who take video, it, there's no other credible incidents involving rape, or violence by Mr. Winslow. A 17-year period goes by, and then we have Mr. Winslow doing conduct which was completely head-scratching. Jane Doe one, he picked up a block from his own home, and then took her allegedly to the, the took her to a place where the, the assault took place, probably about a quarter mile from his house. Jane Doe two, he picked up about a mile from his house in downtown Encinitas. Jane Doe three lived on his street. Jane Doe 5 at the health club that he went to every day. He, took, he made no efforts to conceal his identity. He drove around Encinitas in the biggest and the nicest Hummer anyone can ever see. He is a black male in an area where there are very, very few of them to start with. And he's, he's, long, he's, he's tall, so he stands out. So, what is it about that particular conduct which is important? If you look at it, it, it's something that's completely out of the ordinary for him. If CTE is a degenerative disease and it continues to build and build and build and build, this is exactly what we're seeing here. Mr. Winslow, depression, anxiety, the self-medication, the, the, the years and years of head trauma built to this particular incident. Now, to his benefit, Mr. Winslow, does have the means to seek out treatment when released. He won't be out on the streets. He won't be out in a halfway house. He'll be out with a supportive family, supportive um, relatives, and the financial means to seek out treatment, which will benefit him. Dr. Hopper's report submitted to the court outlined that this is the type of person who will respond to treatment, who will need it in the future. And that's our hope, because Kellen Winslow will be out and Kellen, by virtue of this plea agreement, Kellen Winslow will be out on the streets. Kellen Winslow will be out integrating with the public, and he'll be there for his children. So he knows, as well as his family, they know that treatment is the most important thing for him at this point. Treatment in the future to try to deal with the issues that he has 
and hopefully, you know, we can see whether or not the CT has any type of bearing or any way of treating it. One of the doctors I spoke to said that, you know, we're going to have it, we're going to be having a different conversation on CTE probably within 10 years. Things we didn't even know about, which Mr. Winslow could have used in this particular case, but we just don't have the ability to do it because we can't do that type of examination. So with that, Your Honor, I, I think that, uh, you know, the court understands uh, Mr. Winslow's situation. We entered into this negotiated plea. Mr. Winslow voluntarily entered into this negotiated plea to, to put it all to rest, to finally get on to the next chapter of his life, to get to the Department of Corrections, try to try to seek out treatment there, medical treatment if possible, and to get his life back together again. And he's ready. Uh, he's able to do it. And we hope that the future uh, only holds positive things for him uh, when he's released and, and, and adequately treated. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Winslow, this is your opportunity to address the court. Do you have anything you want to say? <clears throat> um, your Honor, by, I've been advised by my lawyer uh, not to speak right now, but um, in the future I do plan to, to uh, tell my story. Uh, but I've been advised not to, not to speak, but um, that's all I really have to say, Your Honor. I've been advised by my lawyer. My lawyers, uh, not to speak right now. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Winslow. All right. With respect to sentencing, the court has read and reviewed, as indicated previously, the probation report that's filed with the court on February 22nd of this year. And, uh, you know, the court has sat through uh, one entire trial. And uh, as Mr. Carlos points out, we've had this case before the court for almost a couple of years now. The court is very familiar with the case. And, uh, and familiar with all the victims who had the uh, courage to come before the court and testify in person, as we were doing before the COVID-19 shutdown, uh, and face Mr. Winslow in court. And there's, there seems to be a, a kind of a common thread among the victims. And uh, Mr. Winslow, you carefully selected your victims, those that were most vulnerable, we had Jane Doe number one, who was 54, Jane Doe number two, who was homeless, age 59, uh, Jane Doe number three was 57, and Jane Doe number five was 77 years old, and she was alone in the jacuzzi in the gym. And the vulnerability of the victims was no accident. It, it, was, it was the type of victim that you sought out yourself because you felt that perhaps they wouldn't report the crime, and if they did, they would be subject to fierce cross-examination, and hopefully, probably, you're thinking to yourself, they wouldn't be deemed to be credible by the jurors who sat and listened to their testimony. But you did prey on vulnerable victims, and the crimes that you committed were quite brazen. I, I note that with Jane Doe number three, she's 57 years old, you had your bike app on that tracked your location at the time you committed that indecent exposure. Uh, and then Jane Doe number five, as I indicated, she's 77 years old. She's alone by herself in the jacuzzi with nobody else around. And when you committed that crime, you had your GPS bra uh, bracelet on your ankle that you covered up with a towel to put you in that jacuzzi at the same time that the 77-year-old victim was there. And Mr. Carlos, you said that these are head-scratching type crimes because he, you know, picked up victims that were close to his house. Uh, he was driving around his big Hummer that was easily recognizable. Uh, and, you know, you say it's head-scratching. I, I characterize it differently. I think that they're brazen crimes, and, he's, and he selected the most vulnerable victims he could possibly find in order to carry out his crimes and hopefully uh, get away with it in his mind. Now, I note that I've read through all the statements and mitigations that were filed. Uh, it was back in February, uh, February 14th of last year, or actually, yeah, February of 2020. I read through all the reports, and I understand that there, Mr. Carlos, you talk about CTE, but CTE uh, was not present back in uh, 2003, based on what I can read. Uh, when he committed the crimes against Jane Doe number four. That was 2003, before he launched his NFL career, before he played at the, well, uh, before he played significant time at University of Miami. So uh, now he could have suffered some head injury in high school and so forth, but 
but he committed those crimes in 2003 before the NFL career and before he suffered, as you say, the thousand blows to the head. So it just leaves us with uh, someone who can only be described in two words, and that is a sexual predator. And that's what Kellen Winslow II is. He's a sexual predator. He, he preys on vulnerable victims and uh, is very brazen in the way he carries out his crimes. So for that, uh, the defendant's going to get 14 years in prison. This is a stipulated sentence. He was convicted at trial of three counts, and he pled guilty on the day of trial when we had jurors waiting outside to try the case. And by entering into this plea, he avoided a life top term. And uh, it was a tortured change of plea, but the court found he was mating, he made a knowing, voluntary, and intelligent waiver of his rights. The court gave him uh, ample time to discuss it with his family who was present in court. And ultimately, he admitted under penalty of perjury the factual basis that supported the change of plea. And uh, there's no question in my mind that Mr. Winslow is guilty of the crimes that he was convicted of by the jury and that those that he pled guilty to in open court and attested under penalty of perjury that he did, in fact, commit those crimes and stated the factual basis for those crimes. So for those reasons, probation will be denied pursuant to the stipulated plea agreement. The defendant will be ordered to be committed to the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation for the stipulated term of 14 years. With respect to the credits, the court has read and reviewed People v. Yanez, which is at 42 Cal App 5th, 91, as well as uh, Penal Code Section 4019, subsection 7. The court notes that in People v. Yanez, the defendant was uh, placed on electronic home detention, and that's not what happened in this case. He was not on electronic home detention. He was uh, free to roam about, uh, although there were restrictions in terms of leaving the county. He was able to roam about, and, uh, and while he was on uh, the GPS monitoring, he committed the crime against Jane Doe number five in the gym, which was used as evidence to put him in that hot tub. So uh, he was not restricted to home detention, and that's uh, what was uh, addressed in People versus Yanez. So the court will uh, not award credits uh, while he was on uh, the GPS monitoring, and as such, the defendant is entitled to credits of 763 actual, 114, 2933.1.1, uh, I'm sorry, let me start over. 763 actual days, 114 PC 2033.1 credits for total credits of 877 days. The court uh, will order the defendant also to pay a restitution fine pursuant to Penal Code Section 1202.4B in the amount of $10,000. An additional restitution fine pursuant to Penal Code Section 1202.45, any amount of $10,000 to be stayed and remain so unless the defendant's supervision is revoked. The court will order the court security fee pursuant to Penal Code Section 1465.8 in the amount of $200. The court will also impose the criminal conviction assessment fee pursuant to Government Code Section 70373 in the amount of $150 the criminal justice admin fee in the amount of $154, the sex registration fee pursuant to Penal Code Section 290.3 in the amount of $300, uh, restitution uh, pursuant to Penal Code Section 1202.4F to uh, all victims in the amount to be determined by the court. And Mr. Owens, it looks like they're not claiming restitution at this time. Is that correct? Right. Claims. Yes. There is a four hundred fifty dollar amount that will be payable under the claim involving Jane Doe number two, and I have the uh, documentation received just yesterday. Uh, it's regarding counseling sessions, but that would be payable to uh, the Victims Compensation Program, not directly to Jane Doe two. All right, and that's how much? I'm sorry. Four hundred fifty dollars. All right, Mr. Carlos. Any objection to the court ordering the four fifty for Jane Doe number two? All right, then the court will order uh, restitution paid to directly to the Victims' Compensation Program uh, for claim number A18-7040942 for Jane Doe number two in the amount of $450.
All fines, fees, and uh, restitution uh, to the Victims' Compensation Program shall be paid forthwith or as provided in Penal Code Section 2085.5. Court will order the defendant to submit to DNA testing pursuant to Penal Code Section 296. The court will also order the defendant register as a sex offender pursuant to Penal Code Section uh, 290. All right, then uh, that will be the order of the court. Uh, if there is a restitution hearing, Mr. Carlos, does your client uh, waive his presence, uh, uh, do a 977 waiver? Represent your interest in that hearing without you being transported for that? I'll sure do more. All right, then we'll show a 977 waiver for purposes of determining restitution if that is the case. All right, then anything further, Mr. Owens? No, thank you, Your Honor. Anything further, Mr. Carlos? I don't believe so, Your Honor. All right. Well, Mr. Winslow, good luck to you, sir. Uh, oh, and there's a, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, one last Your thing. Honor, there is a criminal protective order that uh, has been submitted. Uh, the court has signed the criminal protective order. It has an expiration date of March 2nd of uh, 2031. Mr. Winslow, I'm going to order that you have no personal contact whatsoever, either directly or indirectly, with any of the victims in this case, and you not come within 100 yards of any of the protected persons. Uh, the uh, court will sign the order, and you will be served with a copy of the order in custody. The court has a redacted version and a version that uses the true names of the victims as well, but that will be the order. And uh, Mr. Uh, Winslow, do you own or possess any firearms at all? No, sir, I never have. All right, then uh, we'll show that the defendant has uh, no uh, possession or access to firearms. All right. Can you do it right down? Okay. Oh, um, just a moment here. Mr. Owens, do you have a breakdown for the sentencing to get to the 14 years? I do, Your Honor. It's, it's essentially 662, uh, but for purposes of the um, of the abstract of judgment, would you like me to, to recite it the way that's stipulated? Yes, the stipulated sense. Go ahead. Okay, and that would involve count four. That would be the uh, rape by force of Jane Doe number two that he was convicted at trial, the middle term of six years in state prison, consecutive uh, pursuant to penal code section 667.6, a lesser included offense of count two, which is penal code section 220A, the assault with intent to commit rape by force of Jane Doe one, the upper term of six years, and then consecutive to count six, which is the rape of an unconscious person, Jane Doe number four, one third the midterm pursuant uh, 1170.1 of two years and the balance of the uh, misdemeanors to run concurrent. Okay. All right. You're agreeing with that breakdown, correct, Mr. Carlos? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Carlos, Mr. Owens. Thank you. And Mr. Winslow, good luck to you. We're in recess. Thank you. Thank you.